All right, welcome everyone to the June 9th Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee call. Um, as you are probably all aware, two things that we must abide by on this call. The first one is the antitrust policy notice that is currently being displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in our agenda. Um, so for announcements today, we have one announcement, which is the standard one that we see every week. The Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have something that you would like to uh, reach hundreds of Hyperledger developers, please leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Um, any other announcements that anybody has? Um, oh dear. All right, so if there's no other announcements, uh, we have the Hyperledger Cello report uh, that's been on our agenda for the past two weeks, maybe three weeks, uh, I guess two weeks. Um, I, I checked it this morning. We still have quite a few TSC members who have yet to review that quarterly report. Uh, so please do take the um, opportunity to do that. And, um, but I will ask, I didn't see any comments, but are there any comments that anybody has on the Hyperledger Cello report? Okay, um, so if there's no comments on that, uh, I have one uh, item on our agenda for today and that's this hyperledger technical steering committee transition discussion document um just uh as a point of reference there we've been having discussions around uh, whether or not we are going to or want to change the technical steering committee from a technical steering committee to a technical advisory committee or a technical oversight committee. Um, so as you are probably aware, uh, and we could go to the second slide, right, that's fine. Um, when we when we started Hyperledger, we had a single source base that we were expecting to bring in. Um, and that was to create a distributed ledger framework and code base. And since that time, we've obviously increased. I think at our maximum, we had 18 projects. I think right now we have 14 projects within the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, we've changed the mission to reflect the fact that we are building more than just a single source base, but a uh, set of source bases uh, that are focused on platforms, libraries, tools, and solutions. Uh, and so kind of with that change, if we go to the next slide, um, we're, we're wondering if we have a need to evolve from the technical steering committee that we've had uh, since we initiated Hyperledger uh, because of that mission and charter change. Uh, and then also the current technical steering committee, we're not really filling the role of uh, typical technical steering committee. And so this leads to some confusion. It leads to some um, expectations maybe not being met as you join the technical steering committee and are expecting one thing, but actually end up getting a different thing, um, which is uh, more oversight or advisory of the entire foundation and all of the projects underneath it. Um, so that's kind of the the, the reasoning or the thinking behind that. Um, also, uh, we have in the past seen that some projects are um, having a very large voice within the technical steering committee and some projects are not even uh, included in the technical steering committee. So if we jump to the next slide, uh, Ryan, uh, this is just a, a, a view of the governance at CNCF which has a technical oversight committee that defines uh, technical vision, approves and removes projects, and sets common practices across the community. Uh, that should sound fairly familiar because it is 
pretty much what we do here uh, in the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Um, and then each of the projects within CNCF would have their own uh, kind of steering committee uh, within them. So that's the way that CNCF works. And if we look at another project, which is LF Networking, uh, they have what's called a Technical Advisory Council. Uh, and that council will facilitate communication and collaboration across the different technical projects. And uh, again, each of their individual projects within LF Networking have uh, their own technical steering committee. So if we jump to the next slide, uh, obviously you should all know what this is. I shouldn't have to read this, uh, but we do have our technical steering committee that defines our vision, approves and removes projects and sets common, common practices across the community. As I said, that uh, one from CNCF should have sounded really familiar. Um, and the uh, actual technical steering happens within each of the projects or within a set of projects uh, by the individual maintainers of those projects. So if we jump to the next slide, um, there is also, that's one piece of this uh, discussion is the name change. Do we change from being a technical steering committee to a technical oversight committee or a technical advisory council? Um, that's that's one piece that we have to discuss. The second piece that we have to discuss is what is the makeup of this organization that we are today? So today, as you know, we're all elected by uh, the community, the Hyperledger community, and the people who have contributed specifically to uh, the projects or the working groups. Um, and the uh, second question that we have to think about is, is that the right way to uh, do, to create this new, if we do decide to name it differently, um, organization, or is there a different way in which we should select kind of this group of individuals who represent um, represent this organization. So if we move to the next slide, uh, there is kind of a proposal um, that's been put in place. I'm not gonna read this yet because uh, I, I think we have some questions that I would like to start with before we get to the details, because I think there's a lot of details around how we might uh, go about selecting uh, the this organization, assuming that we want to change what we're doing in the first place. So uh, with that, maybe we jump to the questions. Uh, and then before I ask the questions, just general comments or thoughts before we, we get into the details of questions. Peter? Uh, the easy one to say an opinion on is the name change. I think that's easy and I support it. The rest of it, I'll probably have to think about and also the other people's opinions and arguments for or against. But just the name change, that's yes. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Anyone else have any comments at this point? Oh, um, I wanted to understand what is the term end user tab shall select to me. That was in the previous slide. Uh, okay. So within the CNCF, uh, it says uh, the governing board shall select six uh, technical oversight committee members. The end user uh, technical advisory board shall elect two uh, technical oversight committee members and the non sandbox project maintainer shall elect one, uh, so on and so forth. So this is, a, this is the organizational structure within CNCF. Um, I don't think we've, 
have any suggestion for uh, creating an end user technical advisory board uh, for CN for uh, Hyperledger uh, as CNCF has. So uh, that's, uh, I guess, you know, could be a future sort of conversation that we have. But at this point, this was just language that you could see as an example of how other organizations are selecting their technical oversight committee. Thanks, Tracy. That's interesting. Yep. I'll read about it. Nathan? Uh, and and we what when we put this slide deck together or when David put the slide deck together, um, we looked at the two biggest the two uh, comp projects here at LF um, to to give examples on how other projects are are managed. Um, Nathan, I apologize. Oh no worries. Um, I'm curious how the project technical steering committee would work relative to a technically technical advisory council um especially it seems like it would acknowledge some of the core maintainer roles that have kind of happened organically over time anyway um but i worry and wonder what it would do to some of the projects that are smaller to where that they they don't really have enough maintainers to where it justifies a technical steering committee for the sub or for that particular code base yeah, so Nathan, I think um, if we were to go to the questions, you'll see that the third question is, do we need to, um, one more slide, right? Uh, oh, I didn't know this slide was here. Uh, maybe, can we, can we just jump to the question slide? Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the questions was kind of, do we even need to formally name these groups uh, as technical steering committees? for the existing projects, or do we allow them to just continue the way they are um, in, in the way that they function today around um, the, the task that they do, right? Um, developing roadmaps, really driving the technical direction of those projects as they um, do today, or do we need to give them the, the formal name of a, a technical steering committee? So Nathan, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but there, I think you're you're getting to the point of the fact that each of these projects that we have within Hyperledger Foundation are different in the way that they do kind of manage the the project themselves from a technical direction. Well, and you know, I, I couldn't say what the effect this would have on fabric, but it sounds to me like this is something that formalizing it would help kind of the family of fabric related projects because it would give more formal authority to that group of core maintainers to have a discussion with all of those 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 code bases. I also think it would help in a project that's as large as Aries, where there's lots of different sub projects mm -hmm. underneath that coordinate between them because formalizing the role is you're not just a maintainer, you're part of this steering committee for this um, umbrella part of Hyperledger. That makes sense to me. I don't know how it would affect a project like Ursa, where there's not very many maintainers at all. And our focus is more on trying to expand the project as opposed to governing the project. Yeah, it makes sense, makes sense, Nathan. And um, I don't think that we have an answer to that question at this point, um, at least not within this slide deck. Um, I do think that is probably something that we would, assuming that we want to move forward uh, with the name change and with changing kind of the, the technical steering committee makeup, um that we would have to maybe think about what we want to do when it comes to the the projects or project families as you um called out i i think Peter? this this is just a a a, a devolution of, of power to where it it actually is i mean personally so yeah makes sense right peter in the case of smaller projects I think we could just uh, call it what it is, as in the set of maintainers that the project has is implicitly also the technical steering committee, just because the number of maintainers is not big enough to need a core subset. Uh, and we could also leave it up to projects to decide for themselves if they want one or not. And that way, uh, 
no one would feel like you're pushing this extra chore on them unless they actually feel like it would be useful for one of those reasons that we already have lighted. Okay, thanks, Peter. Other general comments, thoughts? Um, Ryan, maybe we should go back to the what does not change since I didn't realize that slide was there. Um, so in, in general, uh, the responsibilities of what we're doing here in this group does not need to be changed. Um, we're still doing the same thing. It's just a question of should we be uh, better named uh, to reflect what it is that we're actually doing? And then uh, the second thing that we don't think really needs to change is the way in which projects make decisions today and how they select maintainers. Um, none of that really needs to change uh, when it comes to how we how we name ourselves and um, potentially how we organize ourselves. Come left. So I think Tracy and all, I think, uh, I think uh, having a changing the name to like PAC and TOC as in tech advisory and the oversight, I think is very generic or I think don't have a better is like technical steering committee. So are we going to dissolve the technical steering committee and just changing, changing the name or we are having a two separate kind of thing, maybe one technical steering committee has a different role and responsibility and then creating a different TAC and TOC. Uh, because like, for example, uh, there are many even institutions where everyone they're having their advisory board. And even they don't play that much, like even I'm part of the couple of this advisory councils, but I'm not doing anything there. So, so I think, I think there should be two different things. One is the technical steering committee like here, maybe we can decide the roles and responsibilities and then another kind of TAC and TOC is a, a kind of another like other projects following. This is my thoughts. Yeah, so Kamalash, I think that the general idea here is uh, one to change the name to reflect better what it is that we're doing in this group um, since we're not necessarily uh, stirring the technical projects themselves, uh, you know, the, maybe a better name is the technical oversight committee or whatever um, the, the C stands for at that point. Um, and then the the second piece, right, is uh, what is what is the makeup? Um, and the makeup is more along the lines of increasing the diversity of this organization. Uh, ensuring that there are voices from each of the different projects, as well as uh, potentially making us a, a smaller group than what we are today. Um, you know, initially, um, what was the size of the, the technical steering committee? Was it seven, nine, seven, I think it was. Um, and then we increased it to 15 a couple of years back. Uh, and, and so, the question is, is that too large? Um, have we, you know, um, done ourselves any disservice by increasing the size of the technical steering committee? Um, and, and so, you know, I think in the end, uh, these two things are grouped together because if we're making a change for one, maybe it makes sense to make the change for the other to increase diversity in the voices here. Now, there has been no discussion as far as when this would take place. Um, my assumption is that this takes place when the term of this group ends, uh, which is sometime, I think, in uh, the fall, September, October. I can't remember when the exact timeline is, uh, but I think that's the, the intention for that. So does that answer the question, how much? Yeah, so other thing, like, suppose I think someone also mentioned about, like, having a TSC and the different project families, and then uh, having this TSC and TOC as a as a as a higher level of uh, advisory on or set committee. So I think maybe those kind of discussion and those kind of decision need to be made because I just uh, kind of reducing the number of technical people and uh, keeping the same roles and responsibility for the number of projects. But because I think unlike the other uh, other Linux foundation foundation projects, Hyper is a broader umbrella of projects to 
to see and manage. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, Kamlesh is that Hyperledger Foundation is got a, a number of projects underneath it, which is very different than um, how where it started. Right, where it started was the intention of being a single source uh, base, a single project, um, and so there's been that that shift, and I think that's that's what's really important. Um, now, you know, I I think that the the question here in my mind before we get to the details, because there are a lot of details uh, that have to be ironed out, if you will, um, is does anybody have any sort of objections to this? Do we generally agree that this is a good idea? Um, not changing the what this group does, um, but changing its name and changing its the the makeup of who is involved in this group. Troy, yeah, I'm. I, I mean, I think I've raised this point previously on a proposal like this, but um, I've been cautious about the idea that the majority of the members are basically elected by the governing board instead of from um the technical community and i see mm -hmm. that's in the slide again so i'm i'm again cautious about that point so that particular point uh i'm, I'm really not sure about uh still yeah troy um so uh right if we could go to whatever it is slide eight i think that has kind of the makeup that i did not discuss in detail um oh no no the other direction sorry <laughs> The, the one that has all the detail. Um, so the, yeah, you were, ah. <laughs> the proposed selection makeup slide. <laughs> eight, slide eight, there we go. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ryan. Um, so the uh, the idea here, right, and what I didn't read, each graduated project gets to select one representative. Um, the each incubating project may select also a TC member who would have observer status but not voting rights. Um, this would also provide that incentive for projects to move to a graduated state. Um, and then the governing board selects some number of people. The expectation is not a large number of people, um, which I think is your uh, concern here, Troy. Um, but I think originally when this document was written, it had two um, from that, but we hadn't uh, decided whether two was the right number or not. Uh, and then the, uh, the recommendation to ensure that no single company may have more than a certain number of members on this, uh, this committee. So I think the intention, Troy, really is to give focus to the projects and make sure that the projects all have a voice, um, which they do not have today, um, which I think is where I was getting to with the, the makeup when he was uh, scrolling through the slides. If we were to actually look at the, the makeup, we don't have people here from, I believe, Bevel. Uh, we don't have people here from Iroha. Um, yeah, Iroha. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, I guess we have me from Bevel and a room from Bevel. So Caliper, Cello, Grid, Transact, Ursa. Uh, we don't have people from, and then we have some some folks who are part of the working groups or the chap uh, the regional chapters um, that make up kind of the the current TSC representation. So Troy, I don't know if that that helps. Um, Obviously, none of this has been decided, and so those numbers all get to be uh, discussed in detail as far as what we're going to do, but hopefully that helps. Yeah, I mean, maybe I missed it when you presented that slide because I was, I, didn't, I guess, I didn't. oh, you didn't? Okay, yeah, because I was keying off the um, the example slides, I guess, from the other communities um, where they seem to have a fairly large um, governing board uh, 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 elected representation. So I wasn't sure if those comparisons were the proposal or or not. So I guess you've clarified that. Yeah, yeah. My 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 bad, uh, Troy, for not not going into detail on that. 
um, I knew that that slide would probably bring up a whole bunch of questions. And so I was somewhat avoiding it until we at least got to some sort of general, yes, this sounds like a good idea uh, before we started talking about the details. Um, so again, my bad. Uh, Dave? I'll just answer your question. Do we think that's generally a good idea? I, I, I personally, I do. So I think the objectives are good around uh, diversity and having it be a mix of um, projects and maybe some uh, folks from uh, premier members. So I think generally it's a good idea. I think the devil's in the details and I'm sure there'll be plenty of debate when we get to that. But that's it for now. All right, thanks Dave. I, I agree with you. Um, the details are gonna be the, the, the sticking point, right? And having the, the sort of discussion there. Peter? I also think it's generally a good idea. And in my mind, it mostly hinges on the parts on the slide that are TBD. Specifically, mm -hmm. what I'm thinking big picture wise is what would be the ratio of the sums of elected and unelected physicians. And uh, I'm thinking we should maybe try to keep that somehow 50 50 at least. Or, or maybe we even with a majority for the elected positions. I'm not sure if we can configure the numbers in a way that that actually happens because uh, there's moving parts in that, like the number of projects is changing. It could be more, it could be less in the future. So it's uh, not as easy as it sounds. And I totally get why those numbers are just DPD for now. And then uh, I have a question, which is, uh, in, in the first bullet point where we say that each project can uh, delegate or, or send or whatever the word was. Uh, so each project gets to send one person. So does that mean that uh, there will still be an election and then people can pick someone from the project maintainers or the project maintainers themselves are responsible for organizing an election among themselves and then somehow figure it out. Yeah, it's a good question, Peter. Um, I don't know that I have a good answer for you. Um, right, did, or David, um, Boswell, did either of you have thoughts on kind of that first bullet of how do we get people from the projects to send their representative? Um, my thought is that is a decision that devolves to the projects. And uh, I mean, my idea was probably someone from the maintainers, but I really I personally want to get out of micromanaging like exactly how people work and do things. Um, so if it was an election or the maintainers said, we're sending our senior maintainer or, or whatever, I, I'd be fine with it. I don't know, David, do you have anything? No, I think we're on the same page. I mean, I think it's a best practice in open source to push whatever the phrasing is, push responsibility or delegate authority to the edges. And like, yeah, I, I, I was assuming the same thing that a project could make that decision and they may choose an election, they may choose something else. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't come up with guidelines around that, but yeah, my initial assumption was it was it was a project level decision. All right, thanks, David. Thanks, Shai. Uh, Angela. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tracy. Sorry for my loss. I, I just also want to say that I I, I agree with this. Um, so I, I'm positive with this proposal. I think we should definitely change the name uh, to better reflect what we do. And I also would suggest that we should dedicate as much time as possible to discuss the details, because I think this will take a lot of time to decide on the numbers and the proportions and who is who gets the right vote, vote. So yeah, let, let's give a high priority to this. All right, thanks, Angelo. Yeah, definitely. I didn't I didn't uh, schedule any sort of task force discussion because I knew this was not going to be a quick discussion. Um, that we were going to come to any sort of resolution quickly on. Um, so hopefully uh, we can have some of the detailed discussions starting today and we'll continue probably next week. Nathan? Um, I guess my comment probably echoes what Angela just said. And that is, I mean, there's some things here that, that seem really helpful. Like, can we make groups that are smaller 
that are more engaged so that we can get more work done in parallel. I think that the task force work we've done recently has kind of indicated that there's room for that and that, that will be a, a net benefit to, to Hyperledger as a whole. Um, but there's other things here that, like others have said, make me very, very uncomfortable. Like, how do we balance a project that has, you know, a very large number of maintainers like Fabric with a project that may only have, you know, just a couple? How do we make sure that we're not causing problems for our inclusivity? You know, because where we're doing an open election amongst all the developers with preference choice voting, I think we get a better diverse group out of the entire contributor base. Whereas if we just say the chair of each sub projects steering committee, you know, we, we have a lot less options to try to get a diverse set of voices, um, maybe not from a project standpoint, but from a perspective standpoint. So um, it feels like we're, we're definitely playing with fire with this proposal. Um, so we have to be careful, but, you know, I think that the spirit of it is right. All right, thanks, Nathan. Um, so I've heard a lot of people saying, uh, I think what Nathan just said, the spirit of this seems right. Um, are there people who have concerns that this is not the right direction to go? Um, you know, this isn't this isn't uh, set in stone at this point. This was really to bring the, this to the group to ensure that if there were concerns, uh, that we listen to those and hear those so that uh, we don't, uh, as Nathan said, take us down a path that basically we don't want to head down. Um, so we, we obviously need to be careful. So um, any sort of objections in general to, to what's being talked about or any other sorts of concerns that people want to bring up at this point? Nathan? Um, it feels like there's more formality to this. And I think process-wise, it's going to create some default decisions that are different than what we have now. Um, I wonder if it'll make us a little less agile about adding projects to the overall um, greenhouse or whatever we call it now. Um, and, you know, we should all think about what are the default choices we're making now and how that this refactoring might change the default choices, because a lot of how some of the decisions have been made in the past, it's kind of a, it, a the friction of going through the process affects what, what, what's proposed. Um, and this should change that friction. In some ways it might change it in ways that really help us. In some ways it might affect, say, if one of the other blockchain projects in the universe of enterprise blockchain says, hey, should we do our work at Hyperledger or not? Um, and we might not necessarily see that. So, because they might just not propose that project to begin with. So. I think there's we we've got some time to think through that and let that inform our decisions as we talk about proportional representation, how to set up a project's own technical steering committee, all the things that look sounds like this will make us have to formalize. Yeah, Nathan, I think Peter, uh, you mentioned the the fact that um, you know as we add projects, as projects graduate. Um, you know, that's going to change the makeup of the voting versus the um, people who are, you know, uh, just participating to, to have their voice voices heard for their project themselves. Um, so I, I do completely agree that Nathan, some of the, the things that we're discussing here are, are going to, to have a, a greater impact, right? They're going to be um, changing the way that this group is, uh made up of is changing the the way that this group thinks about things the way that this group thinks about the decisions that they're going to make so um, definitely something for us to to keep an eye on as we uh, go through the details troy yeah i, I that that statement kind of keyed me again um um when we say the members are coming from the projects does that mean their responsibility is to represent the interests of that project and and um more so not not just their own interests right like they're there as a representative of their project and would that be how this is um um, um uh, represented externally yeah it's a it's a good question troy i i mean i think that there each of us has motivation for why we're here Right, um, and I cannot say that I understand the motivations of everyone on this group, 
and you know why they're participating in the sorts of ways that they think and, and vote. And I I personally have enjoyed the the these sorts of conversations where you hear a number of different voices because you you start to see things that are happening in the community that you might not see otherwise. Um, you start to to hear some of the concerns that you know you hadn't thought about before and it, it makes you stop and think about those things. Um, so yeah, I don't know that I have a, a good response to that, Troy, but I, I do think that everybody who joins this has motivations and whether or not those motivations will be somehow different if we have people who are specifically focused on their project, um, you know, being sent by their project to represent that project. I, I don't know how that's going to change things. And so, um, but, you know, this is this is all if anybody has ideas about how that might work, um, you know, understanding the motivation that you have as, as being part of a project and, and also representing on the technical steering committee, I think, you know, it'd be interesting to hear those things. Yeah, I, I think actually it's very important to decide that particular question um, when we start allocating the um, representation by projects, right? We, we, I actually think it has to be very clear that um, either that is the case that um, because we've allocated by project that you're, you are representing your project and the views of your project or, or not. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think it's the same or, or similar to what Nathan was saying, right? Like, or I don't know if it was Nathan, but um, you know, the, the, the characteristics of, of the pool who you're choosing from is quite different um, between an election among the entire community and basically saying um, this is composed of the projects plus you know a couple um, other types of seats right and it, it, it actually does feel like a pretty important thing to figure out from the outset to me yeah I agree I agree I, I think there's um, there's definitely some some thinking that needs to go behind this particular proposal. Uh, Arun? Thank you. So I like some of the ideas from this proposal, for instance, having an observer group who do not participate in voting, but, um, but then we need to define the roles of that observer group because we cannot just ask somebody to come in the call and have no role in participation. So maybe they we need to define those as and the other aspect that I liked here is differentiating the technical steering versus the oversight um, decisions. So I know many of the times we don't end up discussing details of a project, rather it, it should be left to the project and it, it boosts for each project to either group with other projects, for instance, that could be a family of projects, not necessarily a single project, right? And they may all want to work together and create their own steering committees and uh, how they want to lead those those projects, what they want to see next in those group of projects. And, and this this kind of work setup or this kind of setup would bring in certain certain challenges to us, right? And uh, those challenges would be so. Let's say if a TOC is a TOC or TOC is going to approve a new project, and we are looking into expanding the 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 kind of projects we have within Hyperledger, probably just moving away from having multi-party systems and blockchain to all the tools that would help us in building such more and more such use cases using these projects. So that would require um, uh, so having an appointed members only and having no representation from wide spectrum, those could be a, a conflict or maybe like there could be some conflict of interest coming in when it comes to those aspects. And other aspect that I liked in the proposal is um, with respect to advising, I mean, delegating responsibilities for each group, for instance, somewhere one, one of the slides where I read was there is a group that would go and um, suggest how much, I mean, which project should be prioritized based on the needs and necessities. 
I guess that was related to uh, LF networking charter. They, they had a uh, finance advisory board. I know some of the questions related to security, it deals with that. So maybe it could be governing board for Hyperledger, but uh, this particular group of members, they would have that responsibility to go and report or uh, probably give their study or suggestions. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to add in these comments before we could delve into details. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I, I do agree. I think, you know, we do have to define uh, what these groups are, why, um, why they exist and what they're going to do uh, differently. If we have observers versus voting members, um, how do those things differ? Um, what are the expectations for those, those participants? Um, you know, one of the things that came to my mind as you were talking about that, Arun, and I'm sorry, Nathan, for jumping to your raised hand, but um, one of the things that did come to my mind was, you know, if you're only an observer, and and I think people may see it as that, right? What is the what's the reasoning for wanting to join um, and participate in the actual meetings? Right? I, I I know we've had discussions earlier this year about. How do we get people to um, feel like they want to participate more and contribute more to to what this group is doing? Um, it's by providing classes of people within this group. Um, does that somehow stop them from, um, you know, wanting to participate? And and so I think that's a that's definitely a question that we should think about and something that we should. Uh, something that we should look at as we define the details behind this. So appreciate you talking about the details when I think that's going to be key for us. Nathan? I just wonder if we could write down a list of test cases or thought experiments that we should run to, to, to compare A to B on the change. Like, will this, what will the effect of this have on a project that's dying and trying to hide the number of contributors it has? What effect will this have on a new project proposal that might compete with an existing project at Hyperledger? <clears throat> what effect will this have on a project that might maybe is having a maintainer's dispute? What, what effect will this have on whether we decide to spend money on a security audit of something that's not quite in graduate, graduated state, but it's a dependency uh, of some other projects at Hyperledger? And so having kind of a list of things we know have occurred in the past or things that we hope will be better underneath this new option so that we can each kind of walk through that thought experiment for ourselves and have hopefully a little bit richer debate about because i think some some of the details we've talked about we agree with because we think well that doesn't seem like it'll change it too much where someone else in the group is thinking oh that makes a huge difference that will change exactly how all these things work and then some of these details are like we're all imagining the best case option of the migration and we need to get to you know, exactly how are we selecting folks to be part of this, this committee? Exactly how is the governance of a large project versus a small project going to work? We need to be able to imagine that in a way we can all have a shared picture of what's gonna happen there. And yeah, it's interesting, um, Ethan, I, I wonder if the responsibilities uh, page that Arno had created and we approved is something that we could use as a starting point for that that experiment of here's the sorts of things that we do within this group and how do we think that the the changing the makeup of this group will impact each of those different sorts of responsibilities. Um, not having looked at that page since we approved it. Um, I don't know that that's a great place for us to start, but it could be a, a um, something that would give us some insight into the sorts of things that we're doing here uh, within this group. All right, Jim. Hey, uh, thanks, Tracy. Uh, sorry for being late. Uh, there was a pretty important customer call I could get out of. Um, so my, my main concern with the so first of all, I, I think overall on the outset, uh, I, I like the, the, the overall goal of the change. I think it's much needed. Um, agree with most of the proposals. My main concern is uh, the differentiation between 
graduated projects versus uh, uh, incubating and um, voting versus non-voting. Um, I feel like the um, with the change, uh, uh, a primary goal should be how can we revitalize uh, and get more participation from communities, get more exciting projects uh, into the foundation. And that should be um, like looking forward to what the future um, holds uh, in terms of critical uh, te technologies that need to, that this space needs. And I, I don't necessarily agree that a graduating project versus none uh, uh, is relevant. Um, that's number one. So related to that, um, if at least personally I participate in, in, in TSC so that you know I can participate in making changes uh, to uh, introduce uh, some impact as a non-voting observer, uh, that greatly reduces my incentives to participate. So that's that's just speaking from the bottom of my heart. Uh, just just speaking truth. Um, yeah. So that's that's my main point. All right. Thanks, Jim. I, I think that's an important point for us to all consider. Right. Um, I. I I completely agree, Jim, that there could be some issues that come about from having the voting versus non voting, uh, the separation between graduated and incubated. I also understand why it was at it, um, you know, from the perspective of a number of the projects that we have have been in incubation for quite some time. And uh, therefore, you know, what's the incentive for them to move from where they're at today to um to graduate it right um so I, I can see both sides but i think uh for me personally i'm i'm maybe leaning a bit more towards where you're at jim um than uh giving that additional incentive to graduate if i might um i i see uh in my humble opinion, um, I, I think the next two projects to graduate are going to be, you know, Firefly and Cactus. Um, the, I guess the, the, the other side of that would be to, to, to game this out a little bit. Uh, it would be easier to stuff the TSC, right? Instead of having, uh, uh, you know, Project X, uh, you know, a, a member company could split that into three projects, right, or something of that nature, so they get more seats on the board, uh, seats on the TSC talk, talk, whatever we call it. Anyway, Dano. So one of the questions mentioned earlier is, <clears throat> what would observers do? And I think one of the things you know, we maybe call them liaisons. One of the values I think of having these non-voting members. Um, from every project is there's been times they said hey what's going on with project x and there's nobody on the call that can answer for it so that you know i think is one of the values that they provide by having a designated attendee even if they don't vote on formal processes um so when we ask you know how does this policy impact that project we actually have someone who can answer for it so i don't think you know with observers necessarily that you know you're a second class and you're you're not as valued um getting someone in here from those projects that would talk would be a major improvement because um, there's a lot of projects that don't have anybody that shows up to this meeting, and I think we're missing important perspective from them. And as far as, you know, stuff in the TSC, I mean, if you can get that many graduated projects, you know, it's how, you know, that's probably good for the community to have a lot of projects that meet the graduated standard. Um, so that's, you know, that, that is a concern, but I mean, how bad is it that they're growing it to the point where they can get that level of recognition This is another you know, devil's advocate on that. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, as far as stuffing is concerned, there is that recommendation that, um, Dan, I know in your comments, you said we should make that a very strong um, statement, not a, not just recommending, but truly being, this is the limit um, sort of thing uh, for the number of 
participants from a single organization. So I, I think, you know, if we if we think that is of concern with people or organizations trying to, you know, control this organization, um, then then you know having strong language there will help us. All right, Daniel, you still have your hand up. Is that additional comment or? Okay, Angela. No, um, I was puzzled by uh, by I think. Uh, so do I, uh, if I understood correctly, one issue is the size of the TSC. But now if we say that uh, for each graduate the project, uh, there is a seat. I mean, uh, we are not putting a bound, an upper bound on the number of uh, members of this new of the new this new committee. So if tomorrow there are uh, 20 uh, graduated projects, we will have 20 seats there. Yeah, Angelo, you're, you're exactly right. Um, there is a, um, a discrepancy between the, the makeup uh, that is being suggested and the uh, stated goal of trying to reduce the size of uh, the TSC. Now, on the other hand, if we get to 20 graduated projects, uh, I think that says something about this organization as a whole. Um, and maybe at that point, we talk about what we want to do with the makeup of this group um, and whether or not that's 20 is too much. But yeah, it, it's it's something for us to think about, right? Each of these stated goals that we have, there's ways that those stated goals are not going to be met uh, with this particular proposal. Dano? So one thing I've seen other projects do with this issue where, you know, if you're a graduated project and maintaining your graduate status, if it's too many, they'll say, you know, from the set of graduated projects, we will select X number, like four, and it'll be between the graduated projects to decide which four groups get the representation. Um, similarly, you know, if, if we were to have premier members get a seat, uh, maybe they'd re restrict it to say, so no more than three premier members, the premier members will select among themselves um, to do it. Because so that's some of the things that I've seen um in, in proofs in the structure of other projects how they've dealt with this oversized issue i personally would love to have the problem of 20 graduated projects and i look forward to dealing with that to be honest angela uh, to be honest all these layers uh, that complicate i live in switzerland so here we have direct democracy i mean at this point at that point let's let's so everybody vote for a set of people as as we are now i mean all these layers then we have to choose subgroups of subgroups of subgroups of subgroups it gets very complicated but i right, let's see so one of the things i liked about the, the proposal initially um you know one argument is that you know it should be directly representative of the members but every year there's always a huge argument about you know what's a member who gets a vote why don't I get a vote? Why is their contribution more significant than mine? Um, and that's that's not good for the community. Um, another issue is small growing projects might get eclipsed by other large projects. Um, and you know, so we have underrepresented projects who are, you know, the growing edge of what Hyperledger should be. And because they don't have the the five, six years of background in the DLT industry, that particular project might get crowded out of a very important government's process. So while it is complex, while it does have many checks and balances, um, what I do like about this multi-layered approach is that it makes sure that projects get appropriate representation of what they're doing. In this TAC, um, it's it's not like, you know, th there's there's not a lot that has to be done. A lot of the powers are already devolved down to the projects. And this is mostly dealing with inner project and, and Hyperledger as a whole representation. Um, and for those types of votes, we need representation from all aspects of the community, not just representation from the largest parts of the community. And I think that's where this particular structure can be made to make sure that, that smaller projects that um, are, are critically important, but don't necessarily have a bill customers behind it, can still have a say in the process and are represented and their views are addressed in the meetings. Whereas right now, I really don't think we have that. All right, thanks, Daniel. Angela? No, but how do you how do the, how do you decide which are the small projects that are critically relevant? Who decides what's what's criticality here? What does it mean critical? I mean, it's 
you see the more the more complexity you put in the system the more you find you go into legal aspects and the words with the meaning the exact meaning of word i'm not necessarily against what you said to be honest i it made a lot of sense but uh, again words the meaning of the words very complex okay so all right thanks angelo so i i think you know in general what i'm hearing is that we think this sounds like a good idea um but as somebody so elegantly stated the devil is in the details um and i think we need to get to the point where we are talking about those particular details and so what I would like to discuss is, as next steps is you each have a link to this slide deck. Uh, it is open for comments. Uh, so maybe take the take the time um, in the upcoming week to add your comments to this. Uh, think about the sorts of things that we need to expand on. Um, maybe as Nathan suggested, go through and think about the typical use cases that we deal with here in the technical steering committee and how uh, changing the makeup of this group would impact those particular use cases uh, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing um, you know what are the risks that we have in in this makeup of this group and uh and, and really just you know start to start to write some of this stuff down so that other people can see it in the comments um and react to that and reflect on on the sorts of things that are um concerns uh important aspects of of this proposal and then uh you know we can take in uh set aside next week and i think again another hour for uh, additional discussion on the details uh, and trying to get to some place where we can um you know put out some specifics around this particular proposal uh, be it the specifics about if we have observers versus voting members what do each of those different groups do um, if we have a um, you know particular this is the recommendation for how many people uh, from you know premier members we want to include or this is the recommendation for uh the total number of people from a single organization who have a um a seat at this uh at this table um that that's the sort of thing that i think is important for us to get to uh that level of detail and and so yeah i guess please take the time to do that this week um and then we'll continue this discussion next week any other final comments that anybody might have before we close the meeting No? Okay. Well, I appreciate the the feedback and the comments so far. Uh, as I mentioned, let's add some to the document and I look forward to continuing this discussion next week.